Hello, and welcome to another lesson with Miss Washington. Today, we're gonna to be talking about homeostasis and cell transport. Right now, we're in unit three, talking about cell processes and how processes or different activities that the cells go through help them to survive and reproduce. We just finished covering mitosis versus meiosis. Today, we're gonna to talk about how each of our cells transports and maintains balance within themselves. Our standard that we're going to be working from today says explain how homeostasis is maintained in a cell and within an organism in various environments, including how we manage our temperature and our pH. So what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is the process of maintaining a stable internal balance within a cell or organism Homeostasis can also be called equilibrium or equal. So homeostasis is basically you and your cells being able to maintain an equal and stable balance no matter the outside circumstances. Some conditions that we must keep stable include temperature, pH, water balance, and glucose levels or sugar levels. So what are some ways that we maintain, we maintain homeostasis? Well, when we're trying to maintain a stable temperature, we shiver when cold or we sweat when we're hot. These are our body's mechanisms of warming us up or cooling us down. <clears throat> Another example is maintaining water balance. To maintain our water balance, we either, we either urinate or pee, or we retain water or keep extra water. So when you drink too much water, you're eventually going to have to pee. But if you don't drink enough water, we retain all of it so that we can continue to run our systems how we're supposed to. Those are just a few examples. So how do we actually maintain homeostasis? Well, it actually begins with our cells, our smallest units of life. Our cells maintain homeostasis that, homeostasis that balance that balance, balance, wait, I cannot spell today, you guys, I'm so sorry. So our cells maintain that balance by controlling which materials enter and leave the cell. This is also called transport. So our cells maintain balance by controlling transport. The plasma membrane is responsible for transport. This is a refresher because we learned about the plasma membrane as an important organelle in our eukaryotic cells. Remember the function of the plasma membrane or the cell membrane was to control which materials move in and out of the cell. So let's look at the structure of the plasma membrane. How is the plasma membrane built in order to accompany or help its structure and its function? So the plasma membrane can also be called a lipid bilayer. So look at this. We've got three different names for the cell membrane now. We've got the plasma membrane or the cell membrane or the lipid bilayer. We've got three names for the same organelle. So bi means two, and lipids, they are what? Fats. So a lipid bilayer is two layers of fat. We learned about the lipids in unit one. See, it all connects. So the plasma membrane is made up of two layers of fat. That's why it's called a lipid bilayer. The plasma membrane is considered a buffer because it's a good barrier. 
It's considered a buffer because it's a good barrier. It serves as a great barrier between water and the inside of this. The, it serves as a great barrier between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. Your cell membrane is made up of fats with proteins embedded, but its majority ma is made up of majority of fats because fats and water do not mix. So it serves as a good buffer or barrier because fats and waters do not mix. So it's able to keep the contents of the inside of the cell separate from the contents of the outside of the cell. Looking at this phospholipid bilayer, just a little bit of extra if you want to know. The bilayer and its structure has special names. Notice that there are heads and tails that make up the phospholipid bilayer. These are heads and these are tails. So these are heads. Oh, can't spell today. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm so sorry. These are heads and these are tails. These heads and these tails have specific affinities or needs. These heads love water, which is why they're faced towards the water. So these water, these heads are hydrophilic. Philic means to love. Hydro means water. So these heads are hydrophilic, but these tails, they hate water. They hate water. They have to turn in away from the water. These are called hydrophobic, hydrophobic tails. So our lipid bilayer is made up of hydrophilic heads that love water and face towards the water and hydrophilic and hydrophobic tails that face away from the water and turn into each other. This is why fat and water never mix because these tails face in and create a buffer or a barrier and the heads face towards the water and protect those tails. A little tidbit for you. The plasma membrane also contains protein molecules. So our lipid bilayers or our phospholipid bilayers are made up of two major macromolecules that we learned about in unit one, lipids and proteins. These proteins help materials to move in, in and out of the cell as well. So here we have a different, two different kinds of proteins that we see. We have channel proteins, and we have carrier proteins. Channel proteins are like tubes. Channel proteins are like tubes. Think about when you drop a marble down through the tube. It just flows right through. Whereas carrier proteins carry or hold molecules or particles. So carrier proteins carry and move and hold particles. Channel proteins are just like tubes that allow things to pass through. The cell membrane is selectively permeable. What does that mean? To be selectively permeable means to be choosy. It means to be choosy or specific. The cell membrane 
is selectively permeable or specific or choosy because only certain molecules are allowed to pass through. Think about the cell membrane like a chain link fence. Only certain size objects can pass through the chain link fence. A golf ball, yes, can pass through because it's small enough. It's able to fit. Certain molecules that are certain sizes are allowed to pass through. However, a basketball, there's no way a basketball could pass through a chain link fence. Sorry, not gonna happen. So only certain molecules and certain size objects can pass through the cell membrane. That's why the cell membrane is choosy or specific. Also think about it this way. When you go to a fancy restaurant, only certain types of outfits are allowed in the fancy restaurant. You can't wear sweatpants and tennis shoes to a fancy restaurant. You have to be dressed a certain way to enter into it. So the function of the cell membrane is to protect the cell, to control what comes in and out of the cell and allows what, others mo what molecules come in and what molecules come out. All of these help the cell to maintain internal balance or homeostasis or what's that word, that other word? Equilibrium. Your insides have an equal stable balance. So there are two types of transport that our cell membrane is able to do. Our cell membrane is able to passively transport molecules and actively transport molecules. Now that we know how the cell membrane works, let's talk about what processes it carries out in order to help us maintain balance. Passive transport does not require energy, no ATP. So passive transport doesn't require that high energy molecule, adenosine triphosphate. No energy is needed. The molecules just move down the concentration gradient. They move with the flow. However, active transport requires energy. Active transport requires ATP. The molecules that move in active transport move against the concentration gradient. Uh, Ms. Washington, what is a concentration gradient? I don't understand. Well, a concentration gradient is a difference between the amount of stuffs or dissolved particles on opposite sides of the plasma membrane or the cell membrane or the lipid bilayer or the phospholipid bilayer. So many names for the same organelle. <laughs> so the concentration is the difference of amount of dissolved particles on different sides of the cell membrane. So let's look at this. There's a selectively, here's an example. Here's in a selectively permeable membrane right here. Let's say this is a cell membrane. A high concentration typically has more particles on that side of the cell membrane. And a low concentration means that there is a low amount of particles on that side of the membrane. Concentration just means amount of, that's all. So the concentration gradient, if we really wanted to break it down, if you're still a little confused, concentration means amount or amount of. And gradient means particles. So concentration gradient is talking about the amount of particles and the difference of that amount, of the, the difference in the amount of those particles on opposite sides of the plasma membrane is what creates that, um, that gradient. Okay, so going back, going back, passive transport moves molecules down the concentration gradient or with the concentration gradient. So passive transport moves molecules down the concentration gradient. So it just moves from high to low with the concentration gradient. whereas active transport moves against the concentration concentra concentration gradient. It moves up the concentration gradient. So it goes from low to high. So 
So the two types of passive trans, I mean, the two types of transport that we're going to talk about are active, passive, and active transport. Remember, passive transport requires no ATP, no energy. It moves from areas of high concentrations to low concentrations to achieve balance, whereas active transport needs energy. So this type of transport needs ATP, and it moves molecules from low concentrations to high concentrations. At a glance, the, two, the three types of passive transport are simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. The two types of active transport are endocytosis and exocytosis. Let's talk about passive transport first. So passive transport is when molecules naturally move from areas of high concentration, crowded areas, areas where there's a lot of particles, to areas where there's less particles, low crowd, low areas, less crowded areas, low concentration. No energy is required for that. So the idea of passive transport is this. Passively, these molecules are trying to achieve homeostasis. The whole point of passive transport, why are we doing this, is to achieve homeostasis. So look at this. Is this in homeostasis? Is this balanced? Are the same amount of particles on this side, on the outside of the cell, the same as the same amount of particles on the inside of the cell? No, we are not in homeostasis in this first picture. However, look at this. Our particles are moving from an area of high concentration, crowded areas, moving gradually, naturally to areas where there was a low concentration. And over time, over time, the particles passively moved into the cell and have now achieved that balance. They moved from high concentration to low concentration directly through the cell membrane to achieve homeostasis. And no energy was required for that. Think about it this way. Let's say this is your first bank account. This is your bank account. And this is your wallet. Right now, all of your money is in your bank account. There's no money in your wallet. You don't have any cash in your wallet. So you know what you say, I need to move all of that money from my, a lot of money from that bank account and let me balance out and move some of that crowded money from my bank account to my wallet. So you start moving money from your bank account. You start taking money out of your bank account and putting it into your wallet. So maybe put a little $5 here, a $10 bill here, a $20 bill here. So now you've got some money in your wallet. You still have money in your bank account, but now you got some money in your wallet. Over time, you gradually move, and now half of your money is in the bank and half of your money is in the wallet. You passively moved your money over time from your bank to your wallet to make them equal. Think about passive transport like being on a slide. You start at the high point where there's more there's the, at the high point and you don't need energy to slide down to the low point, so you just slide down. The first type of passive transport is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is the movement of particles or molecules from high to low directly through the cell membrane. So simple diffusion or just diffusion is directly through the membrane, directly through the lipid bilayer. So molecules move from high to low directly through the membrane. They're so small, they're so small that they can just pass through. So typically small particles or molecules, So typically small particles or molecules move from high concentrations to low concentrations to achieve balance directly through the membrane, since they're so small. Osmosis is the movement of water, not particles, not sugar or salt, but water. 
In osmosis, water molecules move from an area where there's a high concentration of water to an area where there's a low concentration of water. We will go over osmosis in depth in the coming days. But still, osmosis is a form of passive transport, so it requires no energy. Remember, our whole point of transport is to maintain what? Homeostasis, an internal balance. If you want extra help for, uh, with osmosis before we cover it together, you are more than welcome to watch these videos or, excuse me, you are more than welcome to watch these videos or talk to me, not Miss C. Miss C made this wonderful video. I mean, Miss C made this wonderful presentation, but you can talk to Miss Washington if you have any other questions and she will help you out. The last kind of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. Again, it's still passive transport, so no energy is required. We're still moving molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration, but the only difference is that in facilitated diffusion, large molecules need help getting through the membrane. So large molecules need help getting through the membrane. Facilitated means help. So these large molecules are not small. They need help. So they use a protein channel or a tube. They use a tube. They use a tube to help them out to move from the area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. They use the tube to fit through. They're too large. They need help. Active transport, so passive transport, simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion are all forms of passive transport that help us to maintain homeostasis. The whole point of moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration is to balance out the environment so that they both have equal particles on each side. Remember, passive transport does not require energy. It just goes right with the concentration gradient. However, let's think about active transport. Think about being on the slide again. Passive transport required us to go from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. We didn't need energy for that. But active transport does require energy because if you start at the bottom of the slide, at the low point of the slide, you're going to need energy. You're going to need to put in energy to climb up to the high point. So when you move from a high a low point to a high point, you need energy. So when molecules move from a low concentration to a high concentration, they need energy to move those molecules through. Molecules that move against the concentration gradient from a low concentration to a high concentration need energy because that transport molecule moves and changes shape to help them help the particles move. That transport molecule moves and any type of movement requires energy. Any type of movement. You need energy to talk, to breathe, to blink, to live. You're moving. You need energy. It's the same. In active transport, these molecules, the transport protein, the carrier protein, is opening and closing. And if it's moving, guess what? It needs energy. Think about it this way as well. In active transport, molecules are moving against the concentration gradient. Let's say everyone else is going to lunch, but you've got to go up the 100 hall to the gym. You are moving against the concentration gradient. While everyone else is going this way, while everyone else is moving in this direction up the hallway, you are trying to move up this direction. And it's a lot harder versus just going with the flow and going in this direction. So going against the concentration gradient, you need energy. Another example of transport as far as passive and active transport is concerned is the sodium potassium pump. We all have a sodium potassium pump in our I'm going to share this sound with you.
Active transport is a type of cell transport that requires the input of energy in the form of ATP. The proteins that conduct this form of transport are often called pumps because they force molecules or ions to move from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. This is commonly referred to as against the concentration gradient. One of the more common examples of active transport is the sodium-potassium pump. The job of the sodium-potassium pump is to move sodium ions, or Na+, out of the cell, and potassium ions, or K+, into the cell. Let's take a closer look at how this happens. The sodium-potassium pump has binding sites for three sodium and two potassium ions. Let's follow the movement of the sodium ions first. After three sodium ions are positioned within the carrier protein, an ATP molecule is split, releasing phosphate. This phosphate binds to a location on the exterior of the carrier protein, causing the protein to change shape. As the protein changes shape, the three sodium ions are released to the other side of the membrane. Next, two potassium ions position themselves within the carrier protein, causing it to undergo another change in shape. In the process, the phosphate molecule is released. Once the phosphate molecule is released, the carrier protein expels the potassium ions into the interior of the cell. The carrier then resumes its initial shape, completing the cycle. Notice that for every three sodium ions leaving the cell, two potassium ions enter. Since both sodium and potassium ions have a positive charge, this unequal movement causes an electrical gradient to develop across the plasma membrane of the cell. A number of cellular processes, including the generation of nerve impulses, use this electrical gradient. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain it in a way that you may understand. If you understand understood it before, great. If not, I've got you. <laughs> so, the sodium potassium pump is an example of active transport because active transport, again, is the process of moving materials from a concentration, a low concentration to a high concentration. So, in this potassium, in this sodium potassium pump that we talk about here in this example, we actually need to move sodium potassium ions from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Excuse me, sodium, <laughs> excuse me, sodium ions from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, and potassium ions from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Now notice. There are more potassium ions on the inside of the cell than they're on the outside of the cell. So, and we know that we need to move from a concentration of low to high. So, what we need to do in this scenario we are needing to move our potassium ions, which have low concentrations outside the cell, into the cell, which has a high concentration. Whereas we're moving our sodium ions that have a low concentration inside of the cell, outside of the cell that has a high concentration. So the moving of these molecules inversely is both moving these molecules actively because we have to move both of these molecules from low concentration to high concentration. So. The reason why we need to use energy is because this sodium potassium pump or this carrier protein moves. And in order for the protein to move and push and pump these molecules into the correct location, whether it's inside of the cell or outside of the cell, it needs to use that ATP. That ATP gives it energy to pump those molecules in the correct direction. The 
Because these molecules require energy and are moving against the concentration gradient, this pump actually creates enough electrical signals that allows the nerves in our body to use that electricity from that pump, that energy, that constant energy, that constant electricity from that pump to actually power our electrical signals of our nerves. So our nerves actually use this potential, this membrane potential in order to power the electrical signals that send everything. Ow, I got pricked. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm scared. I stepped on something. Whoa, this tastes amazing. All of that's possible because of this awesome sodium potassium pump. So two things to remember before I let you go. The two types of passive, the two types of transport that the cell membrane does are passive and active transport. Passive transport requires no energy, no ATP and moves particles from an area of uh, a high concentration to a low concentration. Active transport requires energy. It requires ATP because it moves molecules from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Both of these types of transport are done by the cell membrane or the lipid bilayer or the plasma membrane. Thanks for watching.